All right. Got a new pulpit. I feel like I can preach now. It's like, you know, you get a new pair of tennis shoes, you feel like you can run faster. It's like you could jump higher and all the things. I think I'll be able to preach better now. We'll see. Amen. So we are talking about the Holy Spirit, and we have been for about 13 weeks, actually. And this is week 13 in the non-series series of the Holy Spirit. And uh, next week, I'm going to conclude this series. And, uh, and then on August 28th, we're going to begin another extended series on the Sermon on the Mount. And so the Sermon on the Mount, get ready, get ready. Because the work of the Holy Spirit that he's doing in you right now was to prepare you for what Jesus is going to hit you with in a couple weeks. It's life changing. I'm telling you, if you can get Matthew 5, 6, and 7 into your heart, you'll change the world. Promise you, promise you. So <clears throat> that's why we're doing this, this uh, series on the Holy Spirit right now is to prepare you to get you acclimated and, uh, and, and available I was thinking about that the other day. That I've been using the term be available a lot. And I love that term be available. And I was thinking, you know, we make t-shirts about everything around here. Maybe we should make one. Uh, I'm available. And then I thought, <laughs> that's probably not a good idea. <laughs> so anyway. All the singles that would work for you. <clears throat> yeah. So everyone, when they receive Christ, they receive the Holy Spirit. You don't have Jesus without the Holy Spirit. And so we all, I'm just doing a little recap here for those of you who are new to this. When you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit. And... What we see in Scripture is that there are other encounters that happen after salvation. And this isn't as important as to, you know, what we, what we say about it. Um, it's more important that it's real and that we have the experience. So some people say, well, you get baptized again afterwards, or you get a second infilling, or you get multiple infillings, or you get... Um, Continually filled, uh, and I, I would say yes. Okay, that, that's, that's some vernacular we don't need to get hung up on. What we do need to focus on, though, is that there is ongoing experiences with the Holy Spirit after salvation. Okay, and on that, the, we can find that truth in Scripture spelled out for us. And so, it's in these uh, it's not what we call it. It's, it's, again, it's that the experience is real. And so I, I'm hoping that you guys have been hearing what the Spirit has been saying um, throughout this, these weeks, that it's open and available for you to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit anytime, anytime. And, and we are told to, and I, so I'm going to remind you of some of that in today's message. Um, I think I shared with you Somebody else's thought a couple weeks ago that the Holy Spirit came in me for my sake, but he comes on me for your sake. And that there's a benefit when he comes in me to fill me, to help me walk in a sanctified life. But then he empowers me for your benefit so that I can help build you up and encourage you. Right? Okay, so today we're going to talk about... Um, the distinguishing between spirits, or some people call it the gift of discernment. We're going to talk about speaking in tongues, and we're going to talk about the interpretation of tongues. So open your Bible with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to dive right into verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Are you there? Are we there yet? 
It says, to each is given. Everybody say, I'm an each. All right. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. Okay, so let's start here with the gift of distinguishing between spirits. Or the gift, uh, some people call the gift of discernment. The, what is it? Well, it's the spirit, here's your definition, the spirit-empowered ability to both recognize the existence of spirits, whether they're demonic or not, and the ability to differentiate between spirits. So it's the ability to determine what the Holy Spirit does and what other spirits are doing. And let me go a little deeper into that. For those of you who may be new to the faith or you're coming from a background that doesn't believe in some of those things, there, uh, there's a Holy Spirit, and then there are other spirits. Okay? Um, let me try that again. There's the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> and then there are other spirits. Okay? And the other spirits are not holy. Okay? The other spirits are what... The scripture would refer to as demonic spirits, spirits of antichrist, satanic spirits. Uh, and then you also have angelic spirits, um, that, which, which are servants of God, but they're not the Holy Spirit. So the distinguishing between spirits is to be able to determine between what the Holy Spirit is or what a Holy Spirit is doing and then what or a, a, a godly spirit is doing, and what an ungodly spirit is doing. And 1 John, most of you are probably familiar with this, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, you know, demons didn't go away when Jesus left the earth. They're, they're still, still here. They're still around, still influencing. Jesus cast them out, and then he told us, he said, and I want you now to go in my name and to heal the sick, to cast out demons, and to make disciples. So to cast out demons, there has to be demons that are, have, have made their way in. We always pray, Dean and I, well, not always, but a lot of times when we're praying on the way to church, one of our prayers is that the only spirit that would be in activity today is the Holy Spirit. Amen. And, and so we all should, when, we, when we're coming in, check our spirit at the door uh, and, and just say, you know, Lord, I, I'm coming to the communion of the saints today. I'm coming to the gathering of your people I only want to bring what's going to be beneficial. If I've got a wrong spirit, a wrong attitude, something going on in my heart, you know, set me free now. If, you've, if you ever feel that oppression during prayer time when we have our prayer team up here, you need to come and get somebody to, to pray with you, pray for you, and, and be honest. Say, I, I'm feeling oppressed. I'm feeling heavy. You don't, maybe you don't know the word for it. I'm feeling confined, restricted, you know, that's what, what the scripture was, would refer to as bound. And Jesus set the captives, when it said Jesus set the captives free, he was talking about people who were bound by demonic spirits. And for some of you, this is, you know, church 101, but some of you are like, you know, I didn't know that. And so now you do. Okay, back to this message. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world 
by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. So how do we test the spirit? Well, he tells us here, does it confess Jesus is the Son of God? Okay? If the spirit, if, if the message that's being said confesses that Jesus is Lord, you can know that the message is coming, okay, essentially, if they, if they deny that Jesus is Lord, you know that it's not from God, all right? But this, what Paul is, or excuse me, what John is saying to us, he's writing to all believers. So this is different than the supernatural gift of distinguishing between spirits. So we're all to test the message, but, but what he's talking about here, the the ability to, to distinguish between spirits, it's a supernatural ability that helps us to determine the nature and the source of the spirit. I want to give you a few examples of this. In Acts chapter 16, verse 16, uh, we see that Paul discerned the, the power of a slave girl who was telling fortunes and that it, in fact, was a demonic spirit. Now, it was tricky because here's what she was saying. She was saying, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Well, that sounds like a good hype man, doesn't it? Right? They're preaching the gospel, and there's this woman who's a fortune teller. She's, a, she's owned by several people, and they're making money on her telling fortunes. And she comes out, and she's saying, these men are men of God. And what they're saying, they're telling you how you can be saved. Well, that sounds like a, a holy thing, doesn't it? It sounds like she's on our team. And you know, sometimes the devil can sound like he's on your team. And he can come from, it, it can come, the message can come from somebody who may be on your team. Oh, we're getting touchy now. <laughs> and... This woman was saying what we would probably want somebody to, to say, like they're encouraging the crowd. But Paul picked up on something. He discerned something about this woman that wasn't right. And maybe it was the way she was saying it. Or maybe he just, he just heard in the, in, and God revealed to him, it says that he discerned in the spirit that the spirit behind her was a wrong spirit. And he cast the spirit out. Now, get ready. When you start doing this, here's what happened. He cast the spirit out of her. Now she can no longer tell fortunes. You know, the devil can, can tell fortunes. He can, he, can, he, can, he can do miracles in that sense. He has that power when it's given to him. Uh, that's another story. I don't have time for that. Another message. But in this moment... She can no longer tell fortunes, so she can't make them money anymore. So they get mad at, at Paul and Barnabas, and they have them arrested and imprisoned, and they're beaten, okay? And so now that they're, they're beaten, they're put in jail for casting out this demon, for, for using the gift of discernment. But while they're in the jail, they continue to worship. And when they continue to worship, end of story, the jailer gets saved. So, uh, I want the gift of discernment, but you're going to get beaten up. I don't want the gift of discernment, but you're going to lead people to the Lord. I want the gift of discernment, okay? There's another example of this in Acts chapter 13 where Paul discerns that Elimus the magician was demonically influenced. And, and so there was a, a guy named Sergius Paulus who was the proconsul of Rome. He had power and authority, and Elimus has got him basically in his grip, and he's, he's talking to him, and he hears that these men have a word from, about, about God, about the Son of God, and he wants to hear it, but Elimus knows, no, I'm going to lose, I'll lose you if these guys come in here and speak this. And so he starts telling them no, and Paul picks up and says, you have a wicked spirit, and he says, because of your wickedness, God's going to strike you with blindness. And Elimus 
get struck in with blindness. I feel a rap coming on. <laughs> and <clears throat> after he's struck with blindness, Sergius Paulus gets saved. He uses the gift of discernment, and he, and God brings blindness onto this guy, he, and, and, and he spares this Roman governor, and the Roman governor gets saved because of what happened. See, it's real important that we're not just thinking about using our gifts for ourselves, and even that, that I can only do it in church. You are a, a testimony, a testament of the Holy Spirit wherever you go. You take the Holy Spirit with you wherever you go. Right? Like Josh was saying last week, you don't just, you're going to drive your car, put your keys, like Jesus, like your keys, uh, and, and hang them on the rack, or before you go to leave, you just leave Jesus on the, on the key rack there. Everywhere we go, we're a representative of the Holy Spirit. This gift also enables believers to discern whether a problem in somebody's life is emotional, psychological, or demonic, or anything else. So this is, if you're a counselor of any kind, this is a great gift for you to be praying and asking for and, and saying, God, I, I want that gift. And also people with this gift are, are often able to detect or discern the presence of demonic spirits in an environment. And... <clears throat> Sometimes you, if you've ever gone to other countries, like uh, I remember going to Haiti, and as soon as you step foot in Haiti, you feel the demonic oppression. You can, you can sense uh, all these, the ages of, of, the, of witchcraft that's taken place there, and, and the deposit that it has, the stronghold that it has. You can, you can sense that. <clears throat> so, distinguishing between spirits, it sounds like, well, I don't really need that. I would say you do. I would say we all do. And we all need to be, uh, be, to, need to be aware that uh, it's available. Are you desiring it? Okay, that's the question. That's the question. We keep asking ourselves that question. So let's talk about the gift of tongues. Um, it's a gift you can have it. Now let's talk about interpretation. <laughs> right. <clears throat> So there are three, purpose for t three purposes for tongues, and in order to see these purposes, I'm going to go over to 1 Corinthians 14, uh, where it talks specifically about the gift of tongues. Uh, and these three purposes are praise, personal edification, and prayer, or I may have gotten them backwards. Prayer, personal edification, and praise. That's what the, the gift of tongues is for. So let's look at these one at a time. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. So when you're praying in tongues, who are you talking to? God. Okay? It says, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. I love this phrase. Mysteries in the spirit. It's a great phrase for pastors and teachers who who when we look at the scripture and we just can't explain everything to be able to say it's a mystery in the spirit. <laughs> and Paul actually wrote, I think it's in 1 Corinthians 4, that says we are to be stewards of the mysteries of God. And there are things of God that you may not fully understand with your finite mind on, in, in this world, but that doesn't mean that they're irrelevant or that they shouldn't be in operation or that we should just write them off again you're going to see what Paul writes at the end of this in verse 39, chapter 14. Do not forbid speaking in tongues. Some of you have come from charismaniacs. I know that. I know some of you have come from churches where the gift was abused. And some of you have come from places where people said it was of the devil. And there's all of you in between. Okay? So I'm going to explain to you the best I can from what we see in Scripture as to what tongues are for, and, and why they're important, and why Paul 
says, I pray in tongues more than you all, and I wish that you all prayed in tongues. And then he says, forbid not speaking in tongues. Those are three strong statements from the Apostle Paul about something that much of the church today has said it doesn't exist anymore. Just not true. It's just not true. So, speaking to God. We speak in a tongue, speaks not to men, but to God. And what is speaking to God? What do we call that? Prayer. When you speak to God, you're praying. So when we're speaking in tongues, it's prayer to God. He says, for no one understands him. So that tells us that the tongue that Paul is referring to here is not a known human language. That no one can uh, translate it. It has to be interpreted by another gift. And I know you got questions. I'm going to get to them, all right? So just flow with me. Now, it may be a language that no longer exists. It may be the dialect of angels. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of... Did you ever notice that phrase before? Did you ever notice that verse before? There's tongues of angels. You know there's myriads and myriads of angels. And there's probably even different dialects among the angels. Think about that. I mean, I've got no scriptural basis for this. Other than the fact that he says various species of tongues. Which means various kinds of tongues. But he does say that there's angelic dialects that they speak in. And Paul says, though I speak in those, whoa, you could actually talk to an angel sometime, you know, in tongues. You could, I mean, some of you are like, stop it. (laughs) I love what Sam Storms, and I think this is the most concise definition of, of what I would, if I could say it, I would have said it. But he said it best Uh, in his book, Understanding Spiritual Gifts. He says, in other words, there may be other human languages you've never heard before. There may be angelic dialects that you've never known before. Or more likely, the Holy Spirit gives you a language from heaven where he specially crafts or fashions a particular linguistic expression for each individual to whom he gives the gift. I love that definition because that sums up what I have felt about tongues all my life, but have never been able to say it. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> you know, like a, uh, and I've heard people, well, I won't know what to say. I won't know, what if I sound stupid if I begin to do it? And you ever, you ever notice when a baby starts to talk, they just start making noise, and it's unintelligible? But what does everybody else do? Oh, they're talking to me. He said, that, that. And you're just hanging on every little, you're like, oh, I love it. You know what the father does when his children begin to pray in tongues? He's going, I love it. I love it. They don't know what they're saying, but I do. Now, this heavenly language is only understood by God unless someone gives the interpretation. And and we'll talk about that gift here in just a moment. All this to say, for those of you who are thinking, ah, Pastor, there's the book of Acts, chapter 2. You left that out because they spoke in a language that was known by people. You're right. And that still happens today. I actually know people who have been praying in tongues And someone came up to them from another nation and said, you were just praising God in my tongue. And they had no idea. So that happens. What I'm saying is that what happened in Acts chapter 2 should not define or be the standard by which all other tongues are interpreted throughout the rest of the book of Acts. Because the only time that that happens in the Bible is in Acts chapter 2. We don't see any other time where where people are speaking in a known language and then it's heard. What we see is them speaking and Paul's talking about, I'm, when I pray in tongues, I pray, uh, he says, I pray and praise in private too. 
And so there's nobody else around. And, and I'm going to talk about that here. But we shouldn't look at Acts chapter 2 and go, oh, and I've heard this talk that Acts chapter 2 where people are speaking in a language and it was heard and understood. So therefore, tongues now, every time somebody speaks in tongues, it's a known language somewhere else. Well, we don't have any, uh, any other context in the scripture where that happened except there. But Paul, as I mentioned a while ago, said, though I speak with tongues of angels. So there, I'm not saying that it's either or, I'm saying it's both. I'm saying that the gift of tongues is both, and it can be for the purpose of someone praising God, and it's a language that's known, and then it can also be a language that is unknown, which is for, for the private edification, the personal edification. Paul is saying here that it isn't given for horizontal communication, though. It's given for vertical because if you remember in the book of Acts chapter 2, when, the, when Pentecost happened and they began to speak in other tongues, you remember what happened to the, to the people who were out there? They, this is, it brought confusion to them. So it, and it, wasn't, it wasn't a unifying thing for them. They thought they were drunk at 9 in the morning. Starting early today, Peter. So, prayer is one of, the re, one of the uses of the gift of tongues. A second use of the gift of tongues is personal edification. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 4, Paul says, The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, it seems, when you look at this again in the, in the context, that Paul is having to pit prophecy against tongues because the people of the Corinthian church were so, uh, so much more seeking the gift of tongues. And Paul is having to address that they had a greater desire for the gift of tongues. Remember, this letter was written because of an abuse of the gifts. He's writing to, he wasn't saying, you guys, you need more gifts. No, they were abusing them. <laughs> they were using them. And they were, and thinking about the gift of tongues and other gifts, tongues is the one gift that you can use that edifies you, but if it's interpreted, it can edify others. All the other gifts are used to build up others. So it would, to me, it would make sense that, the gift of tongues would be something that I would want because it's for my own edification, for my own building up. And sometimes we prefer to build ourselves up other, rather than others. And that's what Paul is addressing here. No, he says, tongues are good. I hope that you do. But prophecy for all of us together is better because it builds everybody else up. Do your tongues alone when we're together, it's better that you prophesy. So praying in tongues for the person who has that gift is for your own building up. I pray in the Spirit every day. I pray in tongues every day myself for, for the building of myself up. And I encourage uh, all of you, if you've been given the gift, to practice the gift to use the gift. But it, see some other things here, he says. The, the third thing that the tongues is used for is praise. Praise. In 1 Corinthians 14, 14, it says, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. So one of the things that Paul says he does with the gift of tongues is that he prays, worships, and sings in tongues. So for those of you who are like, I, I don't know that I can speak in tongues, much less sing in tongues, you should try it, okay? You should desire the gift, and, and if you have the gift... You should practice praying in it, speaking in it, and you should practice singing it, too. 
singing in the Spirit. Are you with me? I can't hide behind the pulpit because it's transparent. I'm so encouraged about this message, though, for you. Because I know the benefit of these particular gifts. And, I, and, and so, <laughs> can everyone speak in tongues? That's the question. And here's, here's the great divide. Because there are those who believe from certain denominations that you get the gift of tongues um, after you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, which happens subsequent to salvation. There are other people that say that it's only a gift given to certain people, and it's not given to everybody else. There are some people that believe that everybody can get it. Um, and here's what I believe. I believe when I'm looking at the text here, um, 1 Corinthians 14, 5, this is what Paul says. He says, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. Can we just sit on that for a minute? Paul said, I want you all. Let's break that down. Paul, I, the apostle, want you all. I want you all to speak in tongues. But even more, to prophesy. Because the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. And he tells the church, I want you all, and he even uses a, an example where he says, and, and I don't have time to explain uh, why he uses this illustration that goes back to Isaiah, which refers to Deuteronomy about the Syrians coming and the different tongue. But the point is, he uses an illustration about um, why, why we don't do it all together at one time in a public setting, is that if an unbeliever came in, and wouldn't know what was going on. They'd say, you're crazy. But I, I want you to see the, the, sometimes we miss this illustration. <laughs> Paul says, what if you all were praying in tongues? And somebody came in. You know where he's coming? The reference point that he's coming from is that there was a church that might have all people praying in tongues. So I, again, I'm just, I'm just trying to point out to you the possibilities of what Paul is saying here. 1 Corinthians 14, 9 Paul says that we are to not despise prophecy or forbid, forbid speaking in tongues. And we know that each person is given a gift by the Holy Spirit. And as I said earlier, we know that these encounters happen at different times. For example, um, Paul uh, says in Romans, I desire to be with you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you. These are people who, who already had been, who are, were already saved, already been given a gift. We see that at one point in 1 Timothy, Timothy receives a gift from the elders laying hands on him. They imparted a spiritual gift to him then. We see in 2 Timothy where Paul lays hands on him and he receives another gift. He had more than one gift. He had multiple gifts going on. So these are things that we know. Now, I'll be clear about this. It is my opinion, though, that when I look uh, in the text, that there isn't enough textual evidence to say that everyone will speak in tongues, okay? But I believe that there is enough contextual provision to not reject the idea that everyone can, okay? Okay? That's our official statement. Again, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 18, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Paul knew the benefit. He desired it. I think... If I could encourage you as the church today, to, again, dismiss all the things that you have been told about this gift 
and all the gifts, to, to just put them aside for a moment and go back and look at the text itself with no preconceived ideas or notions. Look at the text itself and then let the Holy Spirit bear witness to you what is truth. I promise you, you're going to find something that maybe you didn't have before. Amen. The reason for this letter, I said earlier, is that Paul is writing to a group of people who were abusing the gift. And the only reason that Paul is putting a limitation on the public use and the private use for people or the gift of tongues is because they were abusing the gift. Not because it was a bad gift, but because they were abusing the gift. So the heart behind what Paul is conveying about the gifts is that we all should desire the gifts. Everyone should desire the gifts. We should earnestly desire to be filled, to continue to be filled. As long as we are desiring, we can be acquiring. I made that up, but I like it. As long as we are desiring, we can be acquiring. God will look for people who are hungry for him, and he will, he will feed them. All right, the gift of interpretation in two minutes or less. This really is, is kind of simple. Uh, it's the ability to interpret the tongue that was given. Now, let me put that just in the, the understanding of some things that I've experienced in the past. I've been in churches in the past where somebody stood up in the back of the church and they shouted out in tongues, and then the next person, you know, somebody over here said, Thus saith the Lord, there's sin in the camp, and the sinner is you. Okay. I would just tell you that that was an incorrect interpretation. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you how we can know that. If you're like, how do we know if it was the right interpretation? Well, what do we know about the gift of tongues? The gift of tongues is for prayer, edification, and praise. So the interpretation wouldn't be something different. Right? It's like all of a sudden somebody spoke in tongues. Now I have liberty to become John the Baptist. No, the interpretation has to follow the message. And the message of tongues is for prayer, praise. It's, it's God word. So the interpretation of a tongue, guess what? It's going to be God word. It's going to praise God. It's going to it's gonna sound like a prayer to God. It's going to build up the people that hear it. Right? So... Thus is the, the gift of interpretation. That was the easy one. Why don't you stand up with me? <clears throat> let's, let's all do this today. <clears throat> let's put our hands out like somebody's about to give you a gift. Okay. Right, I want a big one, right? So I was thinking the same thing, Wally. I was like, some people were like this. I was like, <laughs> which, which presents do you like under the tree on Christmas? You're looking for the big box, aren't you? Come on. Father, everybody say this. Heavenly Father, I'm available. I want to receive all you have to give. I desire every gift. Fill me, Holy Spirit. I want more of you. I want more of you. I want more of you. Yes, Lord, we, we're here today saying we want more of you. Holy Spirit, would you bring peace that goes past our understanding? Right now, I, I, I pray against all this 
uh, mental rhetoric and, and the gymnastics, mental gymnastics that people are, are trying to, maybe are going through right now in, the, in their flesh and they're trying to figure this out. I pray that we're not setting aside our brains in this moment to, uh, for something that the scripture doesn't support. But I pray in this moment, Holy Spirit, that you would bring revelation and, and make what is true available and known to your people. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your gifts to us. We need them. We're available to you. We're available to you. You can put your hands down. Some of you may be here today that you have, while I was preaching this message, there was a, an urgence inside of you. You felt this tug, this awareness. And in conjunction with that heightened sensitivity that you've got going on, in your mind, you also know that your, your life is not God-pleasing, that you're not in right standing with him. And I want you to know that Jesus is saying to you, he loves you. And that feeling that you're having right now is his spirit coming to say, I love you so much, I've already paid for the sins that you've committed. When I was 18 years old, I knelt down by a coffee table in my parents' basement and, and said, Jesus, I have recognized I'm not ready for you. I've, I've been living for me, but today I surrender. And Jesus came in my life and turned my life around. If you are here today and you have that sense inside, I, I'm ready for Jesus. I want him in my life. I want to pray with you. If you say, that's me, Pastor, I just want you to be bold. Lift your hand. Say, that's me. Thank you, ma'am. Who else? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Those of you that raised your hand, I, I want to take a moment. Church, we're going to pray this together. It's a prayer to simply help you begin this relationship with God. And it goes just like this. Jesus, I give you my life. Everybody say that. Jesus, I give you my life. Say it again, Jesus, I give you my life. You know, that's a prayer that we as believers should pray all day, every day, not just one time on Sunday morning. And for those of you who are praying it for the first time, let me encourage you. Jesus wants to have an ongoing conversation with you because the life that you've been living has been taking life away from you. And Jesus came to give you an abundant life. And you'll never know what that abundant life is until you're willing to let go of the other one. So Jesus says, there's a great exchange about to happen. Are you ready to let go and let God? And if you're saying yes to that today, then know that God's going to begin to give you new desires. He's going to begin to give you uh, desires, and, and, and you're going to lose the desires for some of the other things that you used to desire. And that's a good thing. He's going to ask you to turn from things that are harmful to you, which the Bible calls sin. And then he's going to say, come to me because I know you're tired and you're weak and you're heavy, and I'm going to give you rest. And if you'll walk this life with me, man, you're going to have some obstacles, but I'm going to help you through them, and you're going to experience the greatest life you could have ever had on this earth. And that's not the end. One day, Jesus says, I'm coming back. And when I come back, I'm coming back for everyone who has declared me as Lord. So for those of you that raised your hands today, I want you to say this. Say, Jesus, you're my Lord. Let him know you're surrendering to him. And then the last thing I want to encourage you to do is 
Let somebody know the decision you made today. Tell somebody, hey, I gave my life to Jesus. You want to start being accountable for the life you're living. There's a number on the screen. You can text that number, and we'll send you some information, a video from me to help you with the next step in your life. That's exciting. That's exciting. Everybody say, I'm available. All right. So the prayer team will be up front available for you after church if you need prayer for anything. But for the rest of us, we're going to go out. We're going we're gonna to declare the kingdom has come and his will will be done in Cape Coral, right? So on a count of three, let's shout and go out. One, two, three. Lead someone to life. God bless you.